our, uh, continue our morning session. So the next speaker is Dr. Debbie Myers from Arca National Lab. So Debbie uh, is uh, one of the leader of the hydrogen and fuel cell materials group at Arca National Lab Chemical Science and Engineering Division. Uh, she's a senior uh, chemist currently at Argonne, and she's working there for many years and uh, has been the leader of the group for uh, over 10 years now. Her research focuses on fuel development, characterization, and cell design for polymer electrolyte fuel cells. And uh, a lot of her work has been funded by the DOD EERE Fuel Cells Technology Office Program, which we know as FCTO. <laughs> she's been the lead on a number of projects uh, from the DOE uh, FCTO site particular uh, in the catalysis area, and is currently leading uh, a thrust in catalysis and support uh, in a multinational laboratory consortium, and which is what we call a fuel cell performance and durability or FCPAD uh, consortium. Uh, she's a uh, lead of also the Electrocrat uh, program, uh, focusing on development of platinum group metal free catalyst development and implementation for fuel cells. Okay. Thank you, Jen, for the nice uh, introduction, and thank you to the organizers for the invitation. So today I'd like to talk first about the status of platinum alloy electrocatalysts for polymer electrolyte fuel cells, and then transition to uh, what the state of the art is for platinum group metal-free materials and how close they are to implementation in the uh, uh, application environment. So just as an introduction, just to make sure everybody's on the same page, I'll give a brief introduction to what a polymer electrolyte fuel cell is. So it's a, unlike a battery, it's not an energy storage device, it's an energy conversion device that converts the chemical, okay, chemical energy in hydrogen and oxygen to water and electricity. Uh, the polymer electrolyte fuel cell is comprised of a proton conducting polymer membrane called perfluorosulfonic acid or goes by the trade name of uh, nafion. That's sandwiched between an anode uh, where hydrogen is converted to protons uh, the protons are conducted across the nafion membrane to the cathode catalyst. At the cathode catalyst, you have splitting of the oxygen molecule to then combine with a proton to form water. So the, both the anode and the cathode are comprised of a uh, platinum-based electrocatalyst. And this platinum-based electrocatalyst is supported on a high surface area carbon. So this high surface area carbon serves to uh, distribute the platinum particles to give you high surface area of those materials and also to form a uh, electron conducting pathway through the electrode layer. Uh, so this high surface area catalyst material is mixed with some, a solubilized form of that perfluorosulfonic acid membrane to form a composite. So you mix it, you uh, introduce a solvent and during dr driving off of that solvent you form porosity in the electrode layer. And so this is sort of an idealized picture of what the electrode layer looks like. So you have chains or agglomerates of the carbon uh, that's supporting the platinum particles. You have a thin film of the ionomer coating those particles, and then you have some porosity to allow gas phase uh, reactants to reach the catalytic site. So this is a nano CT image of an electrode layer. And so this is the idealized form on the bottom, but in effect what you get are some parts of the catalyst that are coated with perfluorosulfonic acid, but you also get large agglomerates of the ionomer in the electrode layer. Uh, so as Mark introduced, um, because this fuel cell operates at a relatively no low temperature compared to other fuel cells, uh, the PEM fuel cell is being promoted for portable applications such as fuel cell forklifts where it can replace the, the battery and be recharged much more quickly than a uh, battery pack. And then all the major auto manufacturers have uh, fuel cell vehicles on the road, some of them commercialized. For example, the Toyota Mirai shown here was commercialized a couple years ago and is available in California. So my uh, program is part of the DOE EERE Fuel Cell Technologies Office, and that office um, establishes targets for the performance of the fuel cell, in particular for the automotive application. And they commission a company called Strategic Analysis to take a look at the status of the current uh, fuel cell systems and look at things like energy efficiency, durability, power density, specific power, cost, and uh, freeze start. So you'll see from the spider chart that in terms of efficiency, power density, and so forth, the current fuel cell stacks are there, but where the fuel cell system is lagging is in durability. 
So the current durability of a demonstration vehicle is approximately 4,000 hours, whereas the target is, intermediate target is 5,000 hours and the long-term target is 8,000 hours to be comparable to what you get from an internal combustion engine. Um, and also, this is the, the, the big issue is the cost of the fuel cell system. Uh, the current cost, based on high volume manufacturing of 500,000 stacks per year, uh, is at $45 per kilowatt. The ultimate target to be comparable to the IC engine is $30 per kilowatt. So there's a little ways to go in terms of meeting the cost targets. I won't talk about hydrogen supply and cost because Mark covered that uh, very nicely in his, in his talk, but in effect, there's hydrogen fueling stations on the west coast, there's a few on the east coast, but there's almost none in the central part of the United States. So in, in order for this to get implemented on wide scale, we need hydrogen fueling stations across the United States. But what I'll focus on today is this cost and durability of the fuel cell system and how we can drive those, uh, the cost down and improve the durability. Um, so, as I mentioned, both the anode and cathode contain platinum-based nanoparticle catalysts, um, and this, based on the strategic analysis, uh, analysis of the entire system, is the cost driver for the system. So approximately 50% of the system cost can be attributed to the platinum-based catalyst and its application to the membrane. Uh, so as a part of that, the DOE has established loading targets for the platinum-based catalyst, which is 0.125 milligrams platinum per square centimeter, or 10 grams total for an 80 kilowatt system. Uh, and just for reference point, the platinum loading in the Toyota Mirai cells is uh, over 0.3 milligrams platinum per square centimeter. And almost all of that is on the cathode. So that's the key catalytic challenge for the polymer electrolyte fuel cell is the oxygen reduction reaction on the cathode side. So cost estimate for the Mirai system at a very low volume uh, manufacturing of 1,000 stacks per year is uh, sitting at $233 per kilowatt. So that's well above the target of $30 per kilowatt. So the key to reducing the cost of the fuel cell system uh, based on this large fraction of the cost coming from the platinum-based catalyst is to either decrease the loading of the platinum or completely replace the platinum with a non-precious metal. So in order to address these two issues, uh, reducing the platinum loading and replacing platinum completely with a PGM-free material, the Department of Energy established two consortia, one called Fuel Cell Performance and Durability to address the performance of low-loaded uh, membrane electrode assemblies or fuel cells at high current densities, and also to address the durability issue that I mentioned. Uh, this consortium contains uh, five different national laboratories, um, and it's Lead organization is Los Alamos National Laboratory. And back in 2016, there was an open solicitation for organizations uh, uh, joined uh, FCPAD. So ElectroCAT uh, is focused on PGM-free material development. It has four constituent national laboratories. It's co-led by Los Alamos and Argonne. Four uh, university and industrial partners were added in a DOE solicitation back in 2017, and five more were added this fiscal year through, uh, again, a competitive solicitation. So now to talk a little bit about the, the chemistry and the mechanisms of the oxygen reduction reaction. So the oxygen reduction reaction is the key catalytic challenge for the polymer electrolyte fuel cell. So the oxygen reduction reaction is a multi-electron step, so it's four electron transfer. Um, it goes through several intermediates, a peroxide intermediate or an alternative pathway is through an uh, adsorbed oxygen and adsorbed OH to form finally the water. The kinetic expression for this reaction um, introduces the delta G for formation of the intermediates in the exponential term and a pre-exponential term that's based on the availability of free sites to adsorb the oxygen molecule. So this theta add that's uh, decreasing the number of free sites can come from either the reaction intermediates or impurities in the system or other, say, oxygen-containing uh, materials that are coming from uh, other reactions within the system. So if we look at the different metals, um, we have uh, the precious metals of silver and gold where oxygen is bound too weakly. So this uh, delta G term is too low. So we have a low coverage of uh, oxygen intermediates. If we look at the other side of the volcano curve, we have copper and nickel where the oxygen species are bound too strongly. So oxygen adsorbs very readily on these materials. 
And th those species are then blocking the uh, catalyst from further reaction. So sitting at the top of the volcano curve is platinum, where the oxygen is not bound too weakly or too strongly. So it has an intermediate absorption strength for oxygen. However, platinum has very complex electrochemistry, and oxides can form uh, as a result of this reaction, platinum plus water going to PTOH and PTOX. And these oxides are formed within the uh, desired potential region for the cathode of a, a PEM cell. So there's been a, a lot of work to, in order to decrease this uh, coverage by this oxygen intermediates and poisoning species by alloying platinum with uh, transition metals. So these transition metals serve to decrease the platinum-platinum bond distance of the platinum on the surface of the electrocatalyst and decrease the adsorption strength of oxygen intermediates and oxygen poisoning species. So sitting at the uh, top of the materials is platinum nickel and platinum cobalt. And almost all the commercial materials you'll see out there are based on platinum nickel and platinum cobalt materials. So this is just an overview of what oxygen reduction catalysts are out there and what people are working on. Um, so we have the platinum group metal alloys that I just mentioned. These can be either in the form of solid solutions or ordered intermetallics. So Cornell is very well known for their work on ordered intermetallics. The advantage of the ordered intermetallics is they have higher oxygen reduction kinetics and they have also have higher stability. So they're able to retain that transition metal in the core better than the solid solutions. So we also have uh, ultra low platinum loading by nano engineering of the particles. And what I mean by that is forming, for example, a thin film of platinum on a less expensive material core shape control catalysts, such as these shown here, that maximize the, uh, the, the platinum facets that have the highest oxygen reduction reaction activity. Or uh, nano-engineered materials that have hollow cords, such as this uh, platinum nickel nano frame developed at Argonne, where you maximize the number of platinum surface sites that are exposed to the oxygen and to the electrolyte. So there's also some very novel supports and catalyst structures, uh, most notably, the 3M nanostructured thin film catalyst. So this is platinum deposited by magnetron sputtering on perlene red whiskers, uh, shown in the diagram here. And these have the advantage of being extremely stable because they form something polycrystalline-like on the surface of the perlene red. Uh, and they also have very high activity because you're forming just a thin film uh, on these organic whiskers. There's also novel supports of carbon nanotubes, mesoporous carbon supports that provide better stability for the platinum materials. And then uh, much of my talk will be focused on these PGM-free catalysts. And this is replacing platinum entirely with iron or cobalt, complex with carbon nitrogen molecules, which I'll go into a lot of detail on that. Other notable classes of PGM-free materials are calcogenides, carbides, oxides, oxynitrides, and oxycarbonitrides. But by far the most active in terms of the oxygen reduction reaction are the iron and cobalt uh, complex with carbon and nitrogen molecules. So this is just a snapshot of some of the platinum alloy catalysts out there, some of them commercialized. Um, here there's a catalyst, uh, platinum cobalt catalyst by Umicor that has over double the activity of the um, comparable platinum-based material. And there's materials developed by a variety of uh, research organizations and uh, commercial entities. And these all have much higher oxygen reduction activities on a per milligram platinum basis than platinum alone. So the DOE has established a target of 440 milliamps of oxygen reduction activity per milligram of platinum. And you'll see in this table that all of these alloy materials far exceed that uh, DOE target for oxygen reduction activity. So what are the issues with alloy catalysts? So we've uh, achieved very high activities, but the issue is once you implement them in the membrane electrode assembly in the fuel cell environment, uh, you see as you start decreasing the loading uh, to the desired loadings by the, the set by the Department of Energy, you see more than kinetic losses, you see a greater than expected loss in the mass transport region at the high current densities where you'll have your peak power for the fuel cell system. So General Motors has done some very nice work in trying to determine the source of these, this uh, higher than expected mass transport losses at the high current densities. And what they and other organizations have determined is that this 
uh, mass transport loss is very local to the platinum nanoparticles or the platinum alloy nanoparticles. And it's somehow associated with the interface between the ionomer and the catalyst and transport through this thin film of ionomer to the catalytic sites. So that's one issue, is maintaining the kinetic advantages of these platinum alloys at the high current densities. Another issue uh, that we see uh, in these online ICP mass spec results, where we're looking at an aqueous electrolyte to mimic the fuel cell, that as we transition the potential above approximately 0.8 volts, we see dissolution of both cobalt and platinum from the platinum cobalt nanoparticles. And so we see this both in the anodic transition as we're going to high potentials and forming the platinum oxide, and also during the cathodic transition as we reduce those platinum oxides. So the result of that dissolution is that uh, as you're cycling between high potentials and low potentials as the fuel cell operates, you see loss of the active surface area of the platinum. You see a broadening of the particle size distribution and a shift of the mean particle size to, uh, to higher mean particles. And this can be nicely seen in the TEM result that you have dissolution of the smaller particles and that dissolved platinum is then redepositing on the larger particles to form these worm-like structures and decrease the electrochemically active surface area for the oxygen reduction reaction. So that's somewhat good news is that the platinum is actually retained in the system for the most part. Um, uh, the, that isn't the case for the cobalt. So as the cobalt is dissolved, it's lost from the interior of these alloy particles. We see an increase in the despacing of the platinum. So we're losing this kinetic advantage of having that smaller transition metal in the core of the particles. See a loss of the cobalt content with accelerated stress tests and drive cycles. And as a result, a loss in the oxygen reduction activity per milligram of platinum of the system. So how is the Mirai achieving you know, the desired lifetimes and desired uh, performance? So the uh, strategy that Toyota has used is to start out with you know, fairly large particles of approximately uh, four, four to five nanometer in diameter. And they've also gone with a very low cobalt content uh, in their initial alloy. So the Fuel Cell Performance and Durability Consortium uh, received pieces of uh, Toyota Mirai stacks, one of them run by General Motors and the other one by Ford. One of them had 300 hours of driving time and the other one 3,000 hours. And we take this sort of as our beginning of life uh, material set. And so what we see after 3,000 hours of operation, there's no change in the platinum-platinum bond length. So there's no loss of cobalt from the catalyst. There's no loss in the compression of the platinum-platinum bond distance, no loss in oxygen reduction activity. Um, very minimal change in the platinum particle size distribution after 3,000 hours of operation. So this just shows from the catalyst side, but we've also analyzed the ionomer in the electrode layers, the membrane, the support. And we see absolutely no change in the material set as a function of this 3,000 hour of uh, real world driving. So how Toyota has achieved this beyond the materials design is to have strict voltage control of their stacks. So the stack never sees any voltages on the cathode above 0.85 volts. So this is then really uh, eliminating a lot of the degradation mechanisms that you see of platinum dissolution, cobalt dissolution, carbon corrosion, and so forth. But this comes at a cost. So you have these strict voltage controls that then add to the system cost. So now I'd like to transition to platinum group metal-free electrocatalyst and the status of that versus uh, platinum. So just a brief history of uh, what's considered the most active class of materials. So this is iron or uh, cobalt coordinated with nitrogen and carbon. These materials were first proposed back in, in the 60s where they were um, starting out with biomimetic catalysts. So these are porphyrins or thallocyanines absorbed on carbon materials, and they did show some oxygen reduction activity in the relevant uh, potential range. They also showed fairly good durability, but degradation pretty quickly in the electrochemical environment. So the real breakthrough in this field came in the early 2000s when the Dodelay group pyrolyzed or heat treated these materials. So they're starting out with sort of expensive uh, um, macromolecules that they're then destroying through a heat treatment process. But what they found as a result of this heat treatment is they, that they are retaining the metal N4 coordination. And this metal N4 coordination is then embedded in a graphene matrix. 
So uh, with the notable exception of some work at Los Alamos National Laboratory where they coordinated cobalt to a polyparole material and saw fairly decent oxygen reduction activity and durability, I'd say the entire field then is gone with this heat treatment of either the expensive macrocycles or mixtures of iron, cobalt, salts, a polyaniline, and a carbon source. Uh, so back in the 2010-2011 uh, time frame, there was two groups that started looking at metal organic frameworks where you have the cobalt or iron N4 coordination highly distributed through this metal organic framework and pyrolyzing that material to form the active site. So I call the, the era, era after 2010 the metal organic framework era. A lot of that focused on a ZIF-8 precursor. So the Dodelay group first used ZIF-8 to form a highly porous carbon support and added also iron and a nitrogen source. Uh, almost simultaneous with this work, the work at uh, Argonne in, in my group led by DJ Liu looked at a cobalt midazolite framework where Cobalt is completely coordinated with nitrogen in the structure, so you have very high concentrations of cobalt. As a result of heat treatment of that material, you're getting not only the cobalt N4 sites embedded in a carbon matrix, but also many cobalt nanoparticles that are then uh, either dissolved in a, a post-heat treatment acid uh, wash or retained in the catalyst but uh, coated with a graphene matrix that uh, then protects it from dissolution in the fuel cell environment. So I would say the real breakthrough came when um, uh, various organizations started using ZIF-8, which is a zinc-based metal organic framework, but only substituting a small portion of the zinc with cobalt. So what this resulted in was uh, highly dispersed cobalt centers coordinated with nitrogen and no cobalt or metallic nanoparticles uh, within that matrix. And the highest activities for this class of materials are seen when substituting iron into the ZIF structure at low concentrations, primarily led by the group at uh, University of Buffalo. And so many characterization results have shown that this results in primarily iron coordinated with nitrogen, uh, so we call them atomically dispersed catalysts. And this uh, uh, rotating disk electrode measurements down here show that the iron ZIF materials have half-wave potentials for the oxygen reduction reaction in an aqueous environment that are approaching those of platinum. So there's only a delta E one half of 30 millivolts compared to platinum. So within Electrocat, we're also looking at ZIF-based materials. Um, the Los Alamos group has a slightly different uh, take on their synthesis of the material where they're trying to, uh, after the heat treatment, have a material that's highly porous to facilitate mass transport of the oxygen through the catalyst layer. So they're starting out with a, a two methyl metazole um, with zinc nitrate and iron sulfate precursors. And by iron K edge excess, we indeed see that they're forming the FEN4 site. This then goes through heat treatment at 1100 degrees C in an inert atmosphere to form this highly porous fibrous material. They call it uh, a ZIF F material and also platelets of, uh, of catalyst. So some high resolution microscopy at Oak Ridge shows that we have uh, atomically dispersed iron throughout this carbon matrix. And yields analysis shows that where we see the iron, uh, single atomic iron, we also see nitrogen. Excess analysis of the material also shows that we have FEN4 sites throughout the matrix. So one of the tricks um, with this class of materials, since you're basically taking a well-ordered material and pyrolyzing it, is to know how much, well, first of all, what the active site is and how much of that active site you have in the material. Uh, so back in 2016, uh, the group at Imperial College developed a very nice probe method for determining the number of active sites. So this is using nitrite, which is a common um, reactant within the biological literature to form uh, adsorbed nitric oxide on iron N4 centers. Um, this Adsorbed NO can then be stripped in a cathodic sweep and the charge for this cathodic reduction integrated to determine the number of iron active sites on the surface. And so by X-ray absorption spectroscopy, we indeed see that using this nitrate treatment, we get a one-to-one -one correlation between the number of iron that are available in the system and adsorption of uh, nitrogen or coordination by nitrogen. 
So using this probe stripping technique and the, uh, an estimate of the surface area of the entire material using the capacitance and the cyclopotametry, we find that the active site concentration is approximately three times 10 to the 12th sites per centimeter squared of carbon, whereas in platinum systems you see approximately five times 10 to the 13th active sites per square centimeter of total material for a platinum-based catalyst. So this is one of the issues with this material is that you have a low active site density. Uh, we can also calculate the turnover frequency for the oxygen reduction reaction, which is approximately two electrons per site per second. If we compare that to uh, just a platinum-based catalyst, not a platinum alloy, we see that that turnover frequency is an order of magnitude lower than, than that of platinum. So these are one of the two uh, main issues with these, these class of catalysts is that you have a low density of active sites and low turnover frequency for the oxygen reduction reaction. So we'd like to increase the density of active sites to address one of these issues. And so sort of uh, uh, intuitive uh, way to in, uh, introduce more active sites you would think is to increase the iron content in the precursor. Um, so Los Alamos has done that by looking at concentrations of one atomic percent iron in the precursor up to 2.5 atomic percent iron. And as they go from one atomic percent to 1.5 atomic percent, they do indeed see an increase in the oxygen reduction activity, so an increase in the half-wave potential for the oxygen reduction reaction. But as we go up to 2.5 atomic percent, we're maintaining the same oxygen reduction activity. So high resolution TEM gives us some insight as to what's going on uh, with these materials. So as you go up to these higher uh, iron contents, unfortunately we're not getting more FEN sites, we're getting formation of iron, uh, iron metal clusters or iron carbide clusters that are not oxygen reduction active. So we're, we seem to be hitting a wall in terms of the oxygen reduction activity and density of active sites. And the, uh, uh, X-ray absorption spectroscopy also shows this, that at the higher iron concentrations, we're getting formation of carbide or metal uh, rather than the desired FEN4 sites. So we'd like to uh, look a little bit further as to how we can increase the active sites. Um, and what we've seen by X-ray absorption spectroscopy is that indeed uh, the Oxygen reduction activity is uh, related to the mole fraction of FEN4 in these catalyst materials. The X-ray absorption spectroscopy shows uh, spectra that are ranging from purely FEN4 at the low concentration of iron to spectra that are typical of an iron carbide at either the high concentrations of iron or high pyrolysis temperatures. As shown in this plot here, as you go to the higher iron concentrations, you're getting primarily carbide uh, in the system rather than the FEN4 sites. So in order, order to understand the system a little bit more and understand what's going on during the pyrolysis process, uh, we performed X-ray absorption spectroscopy as a function of temperature. So we're heat treating the materials in the X-ray beam and following the coordination environment of the iron as a function of temperature. So what we see is that at the temperature between 500 and 550 degrees C, we see that the iron precursors are reduced, forming an FES coordination. So this S is coming from the sulfate in the precursor. This transitions through a carbide-like phase, and the material density is increased at this intermediate temperature. Then at the higher temperature of 650 to 885 degrees C, this is when we're taking the carbide and transitioning to the FEN4 sites and losing zinc from the system as shown in the Fourier transform of the XF. So this was for the 2.5 atomic percent iron in the precursor. If we go to higher uh, iron contents in the precursor, we do indeed see the formation of the FEN4 sites at 1,000 degrees C. But as we're holding at 1,000 degrees C, which is the typical procedure for heat treating materials, we're seeing a transition of the FEN sites over to carbide sites. And this transition from FENX to carbide continues as we start to cool the material back down to room temperature. So what we'll try in the, the summer beam time is to actually quench the material. So as we see the FENX sites formed in this higher concentration iron material, we'll open the furnace and hopefully not form iron carbide from the FEN sites and increase the active site density. So one of the uh, um, main thrusts within ElectroCAD is to use high throughput to um, accelerate the discovery and implementation of materials. 
At Argonne, we have several robotic systems that we use for uh, fabricating the precursors. We've developed methods for multiple heat treatment of, of uh, many precursors simultaneously. And we've also developed techniques for screening the oxygen reduction activity of multiple samples uh, in what's called a multi-channel flow double electrode cell that allows us to look at oxygen reduction activity of four materials simultaneously. We've developed uh, with Nuvant a 25 electrode uh, membrane electrode assembly test apparatus that allows us to look at the fuel cell performance of 25 electrodes simultaneously. Our high three through Throughput Research Lab has a high throughput X-ray diffractometer that allows us to determine phase composition, and we determine atomic structure of the materials using the advanced photon source at Argonne. So one of our first classes of material was this iron dope ZIF, uh, and we looked at three different variables, the identity of the iron precursor, the iron content, and the pyrolysis temperature, looking at sulfate, acetate, acetate, and nitrite as the precursor, and pyrolysis temperatures from 900 to 1100 degrees C. Uh, coming up with a matrix of 39 different materials, combining those three different uh, uh, variables. And we found um, that we, have a, we discovered a material that has over two times the activity of the baseline 2.5 atomic percent iron sulfate material. And so what we found in part of the study is that the nitrate actually give us, gives us the highest activity catalyst and also heat treatment at moderate temperatures of uh, 900 to 1,000 degrees C instead of 1,100 degrees C. And the use of uh, intermediate iron concentrations at this lower temperature of 5 mole percent gave us the highest oxygen reduction activity. So we're now taking these materials and incorporating them into the 25 electrode cell to determine their fuel cell performance. So to leave you with a, a positive message on the progress within this field, so over the duration of the DOE funding of approximately a, a decade of funding PGM-free materials, there's been an increase in the oxygen reduction activity by over an order of magnitude. So where we stand is at 36 milliamps per square centimeter at 0.9 volts, with the target being 44 milliamps per square centimeter to be comparable with 0.1 milligrams platinum uh, per square centimeter loading and 44 or 440 milligram, milliamps per milligram of platinum. Uh, in terms of the air performance, um, we're at uh, about uh, 110 milliamps per square centimeter with the target being 300 milliamps per square centimeter, 0.8 volts. So there's a ways to go in um, improving the air performance of these materials. But there's been great progress over the, the years. So there's been progress in improving the activity of the materials and improving the hydrogen air performance, but where these materials are really challenged is in terms of durability. So when we cycle the, the, uh, these catalysts uh, using the DOE accelerated stress test, so cycling between 0.6 and 0.95 volts in the nitrogen atmosphere, we see fairly good durability, just a slight decrease in the, the voltage as a function of cycling, this being 30,000 cycles as recommended by the Department of Energy. However, when we go to then the air environment, we see a pretty rapid decrease in the, the voltage of the cell with uh, the accelerated <coughs> stress test. So this is a real challenge, of course, because the fuel cell is operating in an air environment. So this is really the key challenge to this field is to improve the oxygen reduction activity, improve the stability of that oxygen reduction activity, and stability of the active sites during uh, voltage cycling in an air environment. So recently, Los Alamos, in collaboration with PNNL, um, has incorporated radical scavengers into the cathode catalyst layer and found better durability uh, of the um, cell when cycling in an air environment. So what this is telling us, if we include a radical scavenger, is that the degradation is primarily due to formation of peroxide, and that peroxide is then degrading the active site. So also to leave you with a positive message is that um, back in 2017, there was a world's first fuel cell stack commercialized by Ballard. So this is at a, a rather low si or small size, not at the automotive size, but this incorporated an FENC cathode catalyst. Um, and this is also um, uh, formed by heat treatment of these precursors. And so in this study at Ballard, they found that the degradation mode of this catalyst is primarily corrosion of carbon at the interface between the catalyst layer and the membrane. 
And so what they've done is re-engineer the electrode layer such that they can mitigate this degradation and see fairly good uh, lifetimes of this small stack by going to rather high loadings of catalyst, but also with the improved electrode structure. So in summary, uh, platinum catalysts with uh, fantastic oxygen reduction activities have been produced um, through alloying primarily and through nanostructuring of the nanoparticles. Uh, however, the challenges still, main, uh, still remain in maintaining that oxygen reduction activity and maintaining transport of oxygen to the active sites at high current densities. And uh, inhibiting somehow the base metal leaching for materials that contain high content of, uh, of uh, the transition metal, which then gives you high oxygen reduction activities. Toyota has demonstrated that they can achieve catalyst stability uh, required for the automotive market, but this is at the cost of extensive system controls to prevent uh, excursions in voltage. Uh, so the PGM catalyst activity is steadily approaching that of platinum. There's still a ways to go in terms of performance in the hydrogen air environment. As I just mentioned, durability is the key challenge. But durability can be achieved by incorporating radical scavengers into the electrode layer by electrode layer design and mitigation of peroxide degradation in the catalyst layer. So I'd like to acknowledge funding from the Department of Energy, both through FCPAD and through ElectroCAT, and the contributing members of FCPAD from NREL and from Los Alamos. Uh, also the contributing members from Los Alamos and NREL and the ElectroCAT Consortium, and my group members and other contributors at Argonne National Laboratory pictured here. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. So looking at fluoride emission, which is an indicator of degradation of ionomer, we do see that there is some fluoride emission, but it's no greater than what you see in a platinum system. So the degradation in performance is primarily due to corrosion of the carbon, corrosion of the carbon nitrogen, and loss of the active site. You mean a loss of iron content from the electrode layer? Uh, we, we've, we've started looking in that. We're, we um, don't have a full picture on you know, what's going on with the iron content. But we do see changes in the car. So we look at the carbon by XPS, and we do see changes in the carbon oxidation of the carbon after the accelerated stress test. Um, are these catalysts more uh, resistant to poisoning than uh, platinum group metals? Yes, they are. And it, indeed, this was the trick in trying to find some probe for determining the active site because basically nothing would stick to these materials. So pretty much everything sticks to platinum, carbon monoxide, or other poisons, but uh, not to these FEN4 type materials. Yeah, well, let's, uh, let's thank uh, Dr. Myers again for talking.